first of all, welcome to the 15th Ward, the Greenfield School. My, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. My name is Michael Bartley. I'm the uh, 15th Ward Democratic Chair. It's a privilege uh, to be with you and serve with you as well. As you know, um, this campaign, this election was a very quick turnaround. So, you know, on behalf of the committee that did so much work and um, Mike McGeever from the 31st, Liz Healy did the lion's share of the work for this quick turnaround forum. Let's give her a hand right away. Um, and it's also really, really important to recognize our four candidates up here because um, they got in and they're rocking and rolling in a really short, short window and, and short time. So we urge you to listen very closely to their answers tonight. Um, stay behind maybe a couple of minutes or contact them tomorrow, get to know them. OK, because um, what they say, what they do um, is really, really important as we have our nomination vote uh, next week. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Mike McGeever, our 31st Ward Chair. It's always a pleasure to be with Mike McGeever and the folks from the 31st. Thank you, Michael. Michael's a hard act to follow. <laughs> hey, look, I want to thank the candidates as well, as well as all the committee people that came tonight. As, but again, to echo Michael's sentiments, Liz did the lion's share of this work. We all contributed to a degree, but Liz carried, <laughs> carried the water, if you will. I'd also like to thank the people that answered the survey monkey for the questions for tonight and the committee that actually selected and refined the questions. Uh, as Michael said, I'm the chair of the 31st Ward, but many of you all know me. I was born and raised in the 15th Ward. So I, I know almost everybody from Hazel and Greenfield. So with all, with all that being said, I'd like to introduce the Al new Allegheny County Chair Sam Hens Greco. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, first, I want to thank the entire committee, uh, Michael, Michael, and Liz, for doing this. Uh, when we knew Corey was going to resign, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we jumped on it immediately and had everybody have the opportunity. Um, to hear the candidates, and there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of effort. Thank you to everybody who um, helped with all the questions. Uh, I understand it was a great process, and, and I think hopefully you, there'll be a um, wonderful ability to hear the uh, answers from the candidates. I want to, I want everybody, to, I want to recognize Leanne Younger, who's in back of the room. Uh, Leanne is our city, is the city chair. Uh, Leanne has been a phenomenal partner already, really trying to build out the uh, city committee and has some of the best swag already, beautiful blue t-shirts that she put together. So when you see her, or you need one, uh, please talk to see her, get, make sure you get one on the city committee. I also want to recognize all of the candidates. I want to thank them for running. Uh, you know, one of the things that's so often underestimated is the, the sacrifice that the candidates have to give not only running, but also serving. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here tonight. Um, just uh, hopefully everybody has received a, a letter from me uh, regarding next week's vote. If you have not received that letter, that letter is the letter you need to come and present at the time of the vote next week, which is Thursday from four to eight o'clock on Flowers Avenue at the Firefighters Hall. Uh, if you haven't received that letter, please talk to your chair and, and make sure that uh, we um, make sure that you have some so we can credential you and allow you to vote. That's number one. Number two, we're going to be having online voting. Uh, so there's some instructions there. I believe you have to request that online by the end of this week to be able to do that. So if there's any questions for that, please check with your chair or check with us at ACDC. Um, and uh, with that, I will. Oh, one other. I'll give you. I do want to give you one sort of ad. On uh, October 14th, Friday night, we're going to have the Kennedy Lawrence dinner, which is a major event that we do in the fall for the Allegheny County Democratic Committee. We haven't done it for two years, but Congressman Doyle I was able to reach out to Congressman Pete Aguilar from California, who's on the January 6th uh, committee, and he's going to come and speak at that event. So. Watch your emails. Uh, you'll hopefully you'll, you'll be receiving more information about that. And if you're not receiving emails from us, 
please send us something at, at emily at alleghenydems.com. We're trying to make sure that all of our databases and everything's all set and ready to go. So, um, um, but um, uh, that just to give you that thing. And finally, thank you for your service. Everybody knows that not only this election is important, but we have huge elections coming up and that your work in the next 60 days is really important to drive out that vote. Pittsburgh is a hub. We have so many Democratic votes here. We need to get them out. So thank you very much. I'd like to uh, uh, introduce and welcome Liz Healy, our, the new 14th Ward Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Sam made being the chair of the 14th Ward look easy, and I've discovered, oh my goodness, how did he do all this? So um, I also want to welcome everybody here, uh, all the committee members who are present, and I want to also acknowledge that we're streaming this meeting on Zoom, and so we have some committee members who chose not to attend in person on the Zoom meeting, as well as friends of the Democratic Committee who are participating on the Zoom meeting. How many participants do we have at this time on Zoom? 38. 38? Okay, so we have 38 additional people who aren't here with us tonight. Um, I also want to thank the three board chairs. I think we made a terrific decision to do a forum as opposed to a, a candidate night and, you know, um, that can become some contentious. We, what we're really planning to do is have a very respectful meeting tonight where you're going to have the opportunity to really hear in depth from candidates and learn what they're thinking. Um, I, I also, we set up a committee from volunteers from the 14th, 15th, and 31st Ward who worked tirelessly on this, putting together the questions. And as committee members, you all, um, many of you completed the survey, and we used your responses on the survey as the basis of what questions should we be asking. So I want to thank Lynn Gagney, Marianne Houlihan, Gail Block, Terry Kennedy, Peggy Freed, Stuart Gall, Ryan Herbenko, and Darren Kelly, who all worked on uh, writing these questions. And we, we, I hope you'll hear the issues that you raised coming out in the questions that are raised tonight. I also, we have a special thanks because we did some real MacGyvering tonight. Greg Kopchansky is here from the 14th Ward. Um, Patty Lord is here from the 15th Ward. And Dylan Rook is here also from the 15th Ward. And Making this happen in a school that doesn't have great technology and that's built like a fortress to be able to have a Zoom meeting to Zoom it out was, was a challenge. And they've risen to the occasion. I think this will make this meeting really go well. Um, for people who are attending online, um, closed captionings have been un enabled. And so uh, you can go at the bottom of your Zoom screen click on those three little dots and you'll see a CC. And if you click on it, you can enable and see the closed captioning if that'll be helpful to you. Um, I also wanna tell you where the bathrooms are. If you go out this door, the girls' room is to the right and the boys' room is to the left. And finally, I wanna to introduce to you the candidates who are seeking your nomination here tonight. Christy Heil is from the 15th Ward. Jeff McCafferty, who goes by Mac, is here from the 14th Ward. Reverend Michael Murray from Hazelwood in the 15th Ward. Thank you. And Barb Warwick, who's from the 15th Ward and lives in Four Mile Run. And with that, I want to turn it over to the moderators. The moderators will be asking the questions. We really appreciate your attention. And I want to give you one last little piece of advice that I got from a dear friend, Barbara Daly Denko, who was really highly respected in the 14th Ward and I think beyond when she served on county council. And her advice to you is when you look at the candidates, listen really hard to the issues. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Peggy Freed, one of the moderators. Um, welcome to what we hope will be an opportunity to learn more about the individuals who are candidates for this important position. This evening's program is not so much a debate 
as it is a forum and an opportunity for candidates to share their ideas and priorities in addressing <clears throat> excuse me, the challenges that face our city and particularly this council district. We all know the importance of having a representative who knows the needs and concerns of the communities that make up this council district. As moderators of this forum, we expect that all of the participants, the candidates in this case, in this conversation, as well as members of the community who join us tonight, will conduct themselves in a manner that is sensitive to creating an atmosphere of civility and respect. The quest questions have been developed by committee members from each of the three wards comprising City Council District 5, based on the survey responses that you all submitted. The moderators will ask the candidates those questions and there will be no questions from the floor. And toward that ends, we ask that members of this audience hold their applause until the program continues. Uh, we would also ask that you refrain from any comments or distractions that might disrupt the serious nature of the matter of uh, you know what we're here to discuss with the candidates this evening. We appreciate the interests of all of you who have joined us for this program, and we're grateful that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to be here. We will ask the questions. Each of the candidates will have two minutes to answer. The timekeepers are in the front row here, and they will hold up a 30-second warning sign for you. And then at the end of your two, two minutes, we'll hold a sign for stop. Um, and side note, I have a mute button that I hope I won't have to use. Um, there at the end, we will have four lightning round questions with yes or no answers and one minute closing statements from each candidate. Thank you. So we will begin um, um, by asking uh, Christy Heil um, uh, the following question. Uh, District five is home to multiple failing bridges that residents have no choice but to travel over and under every day. Given the large number of failing bridges in, Pits in the Pittsburgh area, it will be years before many of the bridges are repaired. How will you hold the city and the county and the state accountable for ensuring public safety in the meantime? Can everybody hear me okay? I'm usually very terrible at talking into microphones and being heard, so just need to check that out. Okay. You, can, you can also hold the microphone if you prefer. All right, that might be the best way to go. So the city is self-insured. I feel like that in itself kind of serves as a mechanism to make sure that they maintain all of their infrastructure. Um, but as we learned from the Fern Hollow Bridge collapse, um, that necessarily isn't always the case. Um, the Greenfield Bridge, we all know how embarrassing that was that it had a bridge under it, um, keeping debris from falling onto the road, um, but that was a solution that worked. So I feel like in the meantime, to ensure public safety, we need to do an audit of all of the bridges, have a third party um, consulting company come and work with the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure um, to assess all of the bridges and what they need and implement anything that they recommend. Thank you. Um, Mac, you're next. Uh, we're an older city and both population wise and in our roads and bridges. Uh, we need to try to gain as much financial help from high, higher levels of government. Pittsburgh really doesn't have the ability to inspect and improve bridges on its own. And so I think what we'd have to do is rely on separate companies to do that, uh, engineering firms that could examine those, those projects. So I think the biggest thing we'd have to do is prioritize which bridges are in greatest need of repair. And somehow we missed the boat there on the Fern Hollow one. But, you know, going through Shenley Park, there's quite a few bridges that are aged. In Swiss Home Park, we have, they're going to undergo a, a major construction project with the parkway. And I just think that we need to rely on work with, cooperate with uh, higher levels of government, the county, and particularly the state. Thank you. Um, Reverend Murray? May you, re may you repeat the question? Um, 
what the question is, given the large number of failing bridges in the Pittsburgh area, it will be years before many of the bridges are repaired. How will you hold the city, county, state accountable for ensuring public safety in the meantime before they're repaired? Well, one thing I found out to be very helpful, go back to the record keeping, find out when the bridges actually have gone through the inspection and number of inspections that should have been taken. And, as, and once you find out that, that information, then go forward and make sure we address as best that we can address the serious natures. A lot of time we do patchwork. Patchwork don't work and then you come back and find out that things have gotten worse. So good public records kept in a place where everyone has access that are responsible for keeping us informed will be a very, 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 very good help. Thank you. Barb? Yeah, um, so I think that it's safe to say or fair to say that um, over the past, oops, am I getting feedback? Um, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, we have, as a city, we've really been focused a lot on new development, which is good, but some of the times what we are seeing is a sacrifice to basic maintenance. Um, and basic maintenance is important, whether it's playgrounds or bridges. Uh, so in the case of Fern Hollow, you know, my kids go across that bridge to get to school every day. It was very scary. Um, so we really need to take a look at the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure and ask uh, what it is that they should be doing in terms of basic maintenance with streets, bridges, et cetera, throughout the city. Um, it is fortunate right now that we have so much ARPA funding, American Rescue Plan funding, so that we can do things like build back the Fern Hollow Bridge at lightning speed. Um, we do have, in addition to the Swiss Home Park uh, Bridge uh, over Commercial Street, uh, there's the Swinburne Bridge in Four Mile Run, which is also on the list of very bad, <laughs> the very bad list for bridges. Uh, that will be a major bridge replacement for, for my neighborhood. Um, so throughout those projects, uh, and, and it has actually been quite good with Fern Hollow, if anyone's been following it, but uh, we need to have transparency, accountability, lots of community engagement and input because these are very big projects that disturb people's um, lives in a big way while, while these bridges are being repaired, so. Thank you. All right, for our next question, I'll, uh, it goes to Mac first and then down the line. Our city council district has one of the biggest new investment sites anywhere in our region, Hazelwood Green. While the Swiss Home Park Slags area is also slated for extensive new development. With these new sites, as well as future sites, please tell us how you would involve the communities in planning so that they will directly benefit from these new investment projects. And how would you go about working with developers to ensure that employees are able to unionize and are paid a family sustaining wages? The project in Swiss Home Park uh, which used to be a slag dump, you know, they developed across the street in Somerset on Frick, the same idea. The problem with Swiss Home Park is we need to examine what the uh, ingress and regress from that area is going to be, because right now it would be very residential streets that are really slow moving. But I think the big thing is if we have stakeholders, people that are affected by that, have input. So there needs to be a lot of input from the community as to how we do it. Also, one of the things that would concern me with that in Swiss Home Park and in the Hazelwood Green is not so much with the Hazelwood Green because is the idea of soil erosion recently because of rains and all that, we've had some landslides. That's a serious concern. I, I think development is important. I think it's a great opportunity for us to help grow our city and help grow our district uh, with really positive things. But I think the main thing that we want to do is have input from people that live nearby and will be directly affected by that. Thank you. Reverend Murray. Well, I believe we need to make sure we have a great, more than a better idea 
on the scope of the land that is being considered. And I believe going through the land use process will definitely help help that bring some some very, very important information uh, to us so that we make sure that even the developers, we hold them accountable that as they come and invent, invest in trying to redevelop on that land, we properly, according to policy, according to the way land usage is designed the whole nine yards, that we hold them accountable, but yet work with our own public officials and those that are in that area that keep a watch on making sure. And we would be one of those, one of the four of us. It's one of our responsibilities. Uh, developers, uh, they come, they're about developing and about making money and about putting up buildings or units or whatever it might be. Yes, they always want to abide by the rules, but every now and then, if we're not policing it, they come under, they get up under the scale or someone kind of turns a blind eye. And before you know it, we have development in an area where land use, the proper way of the land use should never have taken place. Well, it's too late now that you allowed them to have done it. Thank you. And Barb? Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think that we need to partner with developers. Uh, one nice thing about the Hazelwood Green is that it's actually owned by the large foundation Science Benedict and RK. So they have a mission uh, for our communities to help um, neighborhoods and ensure things like affordability, et cetera. So that is a good place to start. Uh, that said, they, that the Hazelwood Green has already fallen short on some of those promises to include the community. The Mon Oakland Connector being one example, increasing the number of parking spaces uh, being another. Um, Hazelwood Green is, uh, well, President Biden has visited Hazelwood Green on a number of occasions. Uh, we are seeing new investment with Elevate Bio at the Pit Bio Forge. There's talk of 170 high paid jobs, six figures plus, uh, 900 construction jobs, and 360 offsite jobs. Uh, we really need to work with labor organizations who are already fighting for collective bargaining at Pitt and UPMC to make sure that every job at the Hazelwood Green, whether it be construction workers, lab techs, facilities, or cafeteria workers, are family-sustaining, well-paid, living wage jobs that go to people in our communities, whether they have a college degree or not. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to see affordable housing in the, in the form of inclusionary zoning at the green and also binding community benefit agreements where we're exchanging tax breaks like such as TIF and LERDA to make sure that the money going into Hazelwood Green is also being used to benefit the surrounding communities. Thank you. And Chrissy? All right. Could you try reset and have you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. Our city council uh, district has one of the biggest new investment sites, Hazelwood Green, while also Swiss Town Park. Um, with these new sites, as well as future sites, please tell us how you involve the communities in planning so that they will directly benefit from these new investment projects. Okay. Um, so the community members are the experts. I I'm not like arrogant enough to assume that I know what needs to be done in these places. I feel like having meetings uh, where the community members can come and express their opinions or any mechanism really where they can share what they would like to see um, for the project is definitely something that needs to be done. Um, I in Hazel with the Gladstone School with that project. Um, there were different proposals for it and the community wasn't consulted for it initially. Um, and once the community found out about what the project was and what it was gonna look like, they rejected it and then provided input. And now it will look more like what they want it to look and suit their needs a little bit better. Um, so I feel like doing things like that for every project need to be done. Um, and as far as unionizing, that, is definitely something that would be a good thing as far as making sure that employees are paid the proper wages, um, how to make that happen. 
I, I'm not quite sure, but I'm an investigator by profession. And if there's something that I don't know about, my job is to figure out how to make that happen and then to make it happen. So I would definitely look into the process um, that would need to happen to help them unionize if that was something they were interested in doing. Okay, good time. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Mac, you're going to start on this one. Um, as a new member, you oh, did you? Reverend oh, Murray. I'm sorry, I Reverend Murray. You're I, I'm sorry about. That. Uh, as a new member of City Council, how will you ensure that all parts of the district, such as the historically ignored areas of Lincoln Place and Hazelwood, will have equal access to services such as paving? snow removal and blight reduction? Well, um, well, I, I come to real. I am on. Uh, I'm on. You want to use my? <laughs> Thank you. Well, equality, equality and inclusiveness one of the things that this city, the city, and I'm not blaming anyone, just living here 68 years, we've had a problem, we've had a problem with it. And still yet, we have a problem with it. To try to assure equality across the district is gonna take a lot, of, a, a lot of work and it's gonna take going into the communities, first of all, and find out where are those areas, you know, we come up with the common things like street paving and sidewalk repair, some infrastructure work. But even as I went down Shady Avenue between Beacon Avenue and Phillip Avenue, Squirrel Hill, one of the things I said to a group yesterday is, did you notice the fact that the tree, tree, tree pruning, pruning is an unsafe condition there? And the wiring is getting entangled. The tree branches are getting entangled within the wiring. And I said, so someone may have never looked at that. That's not, that's not using downtown's opportunity or the council's seat for equality. One fire, one death, then we all run to the cause and say, how did we overlook that? My thing is being in council, we should not be overlooking what we shouldn't be overlooking, and to make sure across the board, District 5, everyone has the equal rights to have in their community what each resident serves. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the interesting thing about District 5 is that it really is a microcosm of the whole city. We quite literally have some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in Pittsburgh, all the way to some of the poorest and most vulnerable and everything in between. People of all different backgrounds and political leanings. Um, with all these different communities, it is very important that the city council person find a way to attend to all of them. My vision for this office is one where everyone has access I've knocked about 1,700 doors in the past two months, and too many people in this district feel ignored. They feel like no one cares. If you contact my office, I will call you back, and there will be meaningful follow-up. I also will serve as a central point of contact for communities and government agencies so that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, and we can keep track of projects and find efficiencies and synergies across the district that work for all of us. Um, finally, I want to, I will have community at the core. That's how we reach equity. This means neighborhood groups, PTOs, churches, troops, sports associations, and folks like you on the committee. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be about the squeakiest wheel. I would like to flip the script and come to you, the communities, when it comes to resources, funding, and initiatives. We're going to plan together so that we can all get what we need. In the end, it's not just about taking our seat at the table, but building a new table where all of District 5 is aware of what's going on in all the other neighborhoods so that we can work together instead of against each other to get what we need. Thank you. 
Um, Christy? So as far as services go, I feel like listening to the community and what the community needs is the way to go. Um, knocking on doors is one way to go about it. Um, making phone calls is another way to go about it, but regardless, just always being available to listen to the needs of the community. Um, but sometimes services are there, they're just not being offered properly, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, for example, in like in place, there was an issue with snow removal and the city looked into it, did an audit, and there was an issue with the machines and how the machines were programmed. They were missing certain streets, but that was addressed then. And I believe that it still wasn't fixed, but in theory, it should have, like once that audit was done and they figured out that certain streets were being missed because equipment was programmed the wrong way, it very much should have been followed through with and everybody should have been getting equal access to snow removal um, but just auditing things like that and making sure that the things that we have are working as they should be working um, but i feel like one of the main issues is public safety in the lincoln place area there is not a facility there that like, they need to have a substation there um, are i think there are certain hours that they don't have anybody in okay <laughs> available like in their ems station during the nights um and that's really not acceptable because you can't decide when somebody's going to have a heart attack and need emergency services um so having a facility where that kind of thing is more accessible to them is they deserve that they pay taxes um that's it's just not okay thank you um Okay. Living in Pittsburgh for a long time, the two major complaints that everybody has is street paving and snow removal. And I think the key here is transparency. That, and I think the city has made some efforts in that in putting installing GPS in the snow removal trucks, the plows. And obviously, you have to prioritize which streets get done first, main arteries get done before side streets. I live on a dead end street. I fully don't expect them to come plow my street as soon as it snows. Okay. But I think if we're transparent, we have a process set up when there's snowfall, these are the roads we hit first. These are the ones we hit second. You can go online, see where the trucks are. I think it's a, a good idea. Uh, paving the same thing. We're on a schedule of so many, every so many years, you repave a street. And until that point, you, you need to make repairs that are needed based on you know, utility companies digging them up because it seems like that's as soon as they uh, lay down new pavement, a utility company comes and tears it up. So I think transparency is the biggest thing. In an area like Lincoln Place or New Homestead, I, I think proximity to other municipalities, if we could enter into an agreement with nearby municipalities for things like snow removal. We'll remove some of the streets for you, snow from some of the streets for you if you do the same for us. And I think that's a possible solution. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Murray, you started, you started that one, right? Okay, all right. Okay, we're gonna start, uh, Barb, with uh, this question. After a young boy was recently struck and killed by a vehicle in Glen Hazel, uh, part of Greater Hazelwood, uh, residents across District 5 are concerned about the pedestrian safety in high traffic areas, especially in residential areas and near schools. What traffic calming measures do you support and how would you ensure that these resources are allocated equitably? Yeah, so I think that when it comes to traffic calming in reference to the last question, it's one of the areas where we really can see the most blatant inequities across the district. Um, there are 20 speed bumps and or speed humps in 15217 and there are zero in 15207. Um, again, the squeaky wheel approach to traffic calming is not working where the largest, wealthiest, or most organized communities are getting the solutions they need 
and other communities are asking for basic traffic calming in areas where our kids walk to and from school year after year after year, just to see nothing appear in the capital budget. Um, when it comes to public safety, I would say that traffic calming, the fear that our kids are going to be hit by a car while they're playing in front of our homes is one of the biggest fears that probably any parent or grandparent in this room can think of. It's very real and it's every day. Um, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure needs to change its approach to traffic calming. For every street maintenance, every piece of work or activity that is done on any street across the entire city, there should be an assessment for low cost traffic calming and pedestrian access to see what can be done the most quickly and the most efficiently. We're talking speed humps, plastic ballards, painted lines. This stuff is not complicated. We need to make our streets safer for walking, for living, for making Pittsburgh a better place. Question to you, Christy. So one of my favorite things to do, which is odd, um, but nonetheless, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I live just off of Beachwood Boulevard um, and I constantly hear sirens go by and determining whether it's like a police siren or an ambulance or a fire truck, just, I don't know why, but I like to do that. Um, so on that night, my son and I were there and we were doing exactly that and we hear, three police vehicles go by, and then we see an ambulance go by, followed by another police um, vehicle. And so we knew that it was something terrible that had happened. Um, and somebody who is very, very close to me actually responded to that call, and he will be forever changed uh, based on what he saw that night. Um, and he's seen a lot of things being in the position that he is in. So that's saying a lot. Um, but implementing things as simple as having police presence in places like that is enough to deter certain amounts of traffic things. Um, it, police issuing citations is even more of a deterrent. Um, so something as simple as that or implementing speed humps, um, signage, traffic lights, anything along those lines. Um, but speed humps are an issue that some communities support and some don't. Um, they're not fun to drive over. Yes, they're very, very helpful. Um, they were in, they were put in front, like on the street that my house is on. Um, and before they were there, traffic was horrible. After they were there, people do go significantly slower. So it is effective and it does work. Um, so even though there are downsides to it, it is effective and definitely an option that we should look into doing more of. Thank you. To you, Mac. Thank you. Um, speed humps, people have become more and more aware of them. The recently going to, I have a business up in Carrick. I have to drive through, I, typically I drive through Homestead. 837 has been closed. I've been driving through Hazelwood a lot more. Johnston Avenue is seeing way increased traffic as a result of the construction in Homestead. And so I think that speed humps can be a good thing. I think rumble strips can be a, a traffic calming tool. Increased signage. I think an increased police presence, not constantly, but you have to identify targeted areas where people are exceeding the speed limit. And if it's especially in a, in a residential area, a high population area like Johnston Avenue, you have to have increased police police targeting of those things. But I think signage, rumble strips, speed humps should cover it. And I think that I agree with uh, whoever mentioned it before, it needs to be done equitably all across the city. I know up in Carrick, they've installed them on Maytai. Uh, so there's different places in the city. Pitts, Pittsburgh is, is a bunch of different communities and District 5 is really varied. So I think that we need to look at those types of things to calm traffic. And to you, Reverend Murray. I'm very dear to this situation because at the age of 13, I lost my five-year-old brother being hit by a car 
on 2nd Avenue at 2nd Avenue and Glenwood Avenue. This is 1968. We're in 2022. Measures about public safety should have made an advancement far beyond where it is even now. We shouldn't be crying out to public, to public the, the city public offices about slowing down traffic and having speed limits enforced. We're, this, we shouldn't be there. We should be beyond that. And even now to get the traffic calming done, especially speed bumps, there's an application process. Listen, there's people out there, kids getting hit every day. It's just not being reported as much as it is. We have ordinances we can pass. Enforce them. Put more policing out there in those areas. Most people don't, don't go real fast. We used to have speed traps, 2nd Avenue between 2nd Avenue and Greenfield and Hazelwood Avenue constantly. It made you slow down. Even if you didn't see them, it was branded in your mind that this is an area you need to obey the enforcement of public safety when it comes to traffic calming. And so in lieu of all that, just bring it back to City Hall so that the communities that in District 5, they deserve not to go through that. Bring it back and let's do something about it except for set up something. Thank you. Yeah, uh, next question here is, yep. We'll start with uh, Reverend Murray. <laughs> Uh, what proposals would you support for controlling the deer population, which is devastating our city parks, destroying gardens and shrubs, and spreading tick-borne diseases? Well, some hunters ain't going to like this, but some will. Some non-hunters won't like this, but we can allow to increase the hunting opportunities for the deer population to slow it down uh, so that we would not have such a major increase of deer population. We, we can call it some measure of population control. Then we can do measures where there's different ways you can uh, take an area and patrol it. When you find that deer are populating in there, that area, there's different measures and if we want to be able to put it under control, there's a way where, now this might sound humane to some people, but there's a way where you can help the deer, especially the female deer, not populate so much. And I'm not talking about go in and do like we do dogs and cats or whatever it might be. And No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about there's creative ways that don't kill the deer, but it will slow down the population of it. Or there's other ways where we can try to build borders or try to build certain ways where the deer cannot come into certain areas so easily and populate. I ain't saying run them to somebody else's area, but you got to have deer population. You got to have a way to keep the control. You got to have a way to put the control under measure. So those ways will help that. It'll do just that. Although they sound some of them a little mean, it does work. Okay, we're going to go that direction now. Max, you're, you're next. Oh, you're going to reverse now. Okay. Uh, my hostas in my front yard would like to see deer control. Uh, they didn't bother my hostas for 20 years, but this year they wiped them out. I, I would not be in favor of like a controlled hunt for deer. I, you know, I just don't see it as appropriate in the city. I think there are probably some biological measures that we could take to slow down the reproduction of deer. Um, you know, growing up, Reverend Murray and I are pretty close in age. When I was a kid, to see a deer would have been like seeing a dinosaur in Pittsburgh. You know, we were happy if we saw a rabbit. Uh, now that deer are walking around my neighborhood like, like they own it. Uh, but they are not as cute as they used to be to me. Uh, so I think that we'd have to look at different ways of, I, I, like I said, I'm not in favor of a controlled hunt or having bow hunters or anything out there like other communities have done. Uh, I would look more for science to try to help us out there with holding down the deer population. Thank you. Uh, 
Christy? So I'm from the country. I love seeing. Okay. Sure's working. I think so. It was just having a moment. <laughs> uh, but I'm from the country and I love seeing deer. It makes me feel like I'm at home, but they are, they can be bad for the environment um, in a lot of ways. So I definitely feel like they're at the point now where they need something needs to happen to get them under control a little bit. And what that is, I don't know. My background from being from central PA, a lot of people hunt there. Do I think that's the right answer here? Probably not. Um, I making sure that they don't reproduce as much. Um, however, they do that, that would be one way to go. That could also be considered equally inhumane, um, introducing predators, um, which I think is even more humane. I don't think anybody has the right answer yet, but I feel like that's something that needs looked into and we need to implement whatever is the most humane way to control the deer population because it's only going to get worse. Um, they, like I have five actually, who I consider my pet deer who are in my yard pretty much every day. Um, and that's not a good thing. Well, I think it's cute. It's, it's not good. Um, there are more traffic accidents due to deer. Um, they're, they have ticks, which give Lyme's disease. Like my dad has Lyme disease. That's not something that's a fun time. That's not something that somebody wants to have. So anything that could decrease the likelihood of that happening, um, we should do. So long story short, I don't know what the right answer is. I would be supported in anything that was humane um, to control the situation without killing my pets. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I just happened to see an article pop up on Facebook about this issue. So um, there, there's a particular problem in Shenley Park. Uh, so having read the article, apparently the deer are, um, not only is overpopulation bad for us, for our gardens, and also for the plant life in the park, it's also bad for the deer because they're not able to hide like they need to. They're undernourished, et cetera. So, um, so I called up animal control to see what, uh, what needs to be done about the deer population. Uh, what I was told is that animal control cannot do anything with the deer. So the deer population in Pennsylvania are managed exclusively by the State Game Commission. Um, all that animal control can do is deal with a deer that has been killed or severely injured. Um, so, you know, short of us all driving around hitting deer with our cars, uh, I think that what we will need to do is call up the PA State Game Commission sit down at the table and figure out what can be done. My understanding is that the game commission does not do culling, which is to, to hunt the deer or, or uh, because it's too controversial. Uh, there are options for birth control measures that you can give to the does uh, every three months or so, but of course they're expensive. Whatever needs to be done, it starts with a conversation with the PA State Game Commission and hopefully we can get this deer population under control. Okay, thank you. All right, our next uh, question is going to Mac first since we're kind of boomeranging, boomeranging back. Um, given that the city is in negotiations with the police bargaining unit now for a new union contract, what proposals should the city make regarding misconduct and discipline for the Bureau of Police staff? It's a complicated issue. Um, I think Pittsburgh has been insulated from the serious issues that other cities have faced. Not that we have not had our problems. Uh, I think one of the things that I miss was a few years ago when we had uh, community policing policies where you had neighborhood police uh, in your neighborhood, in our communities, so that people were familiar with them. It makes it more human. I think that one of the issues is our limitations with the parameters of the collective bargaining unit in Act 111. Uh, we wanna make some efforts uh, for the public safety department that matches the diversity of our population. One of the issues that we have, 84% of our police force is uh, white and male. 
I think that we need to find a way to recruit more minorities. And I'm not saying lower the standard. I'm saying identify people, diverse people that are that can meet the same high standard to become involved in uh, public safety, not just police, but also fire and paramedics. Those are, I think, uh, some of the main issues. I think we need to negotiate with the police bargaining unit to improve our uh, current system. Uh, we have to make, uh, we have to collaborate with, uh, I think if we collaborated with Pittsburgh Public Schools, Peabody used to be the public safety magnet. I think incorporating a program like that in Pittsburgh would be good with community college as a way using the Pittsburgh Promise to educate people and encourage them to go into the public safety field. Thank you. Thank you. And to you, Christy. So the way that the city is set up now in terms of police misconduct, there are two departments that handle that. One is the Office of Municipal Investigations and the other is the, the Police Citizens Review Board. Um, the Office of Municipal Investigations happens to be where I worked prior to working at Pitt. Um, and that is part of the police department in a way. So the police department is required to give OMI documents and things that they don't necessarily have to give to the other organization. So it makes it a little bit more difficult for, for them to properly investigate anything because they don't always have all of the information that they need. Um, OMI, on the other hand, gets all of the information and they can properly investigate it to the best of their abilities, but we can't implement, well, OMI can't implement any kind of discipline. Um, so all that they can do is recommend what they think, if it was founded or sustained um, or unfounded. And then we pass it along to the Bureau and they decide what to do with it. I feel like having a little bit more input in terms of what discipline should be implemented would probably be a better way to go. And that's something that we should advocate for with FOP. Making that happen probably would be a huge fight, but definitely a fight worth happening because in the end, making everything a little bit more combined and well working, well oiled um, is definitely the way to go rather than having different resources that aren't functioning properly. Thank you. And a question to you, Barb. Oh, um, yeah, so transparency and accountability in our policing are, um, are critical. It's good for communities and it's also good for our law enforcement officers. Um, we need to do everything we can to make sure that nonviolent offenses like stealing a bicycle do not result in violent tragedies. Um, ultimately, accountability through things like the Citizen Police Review Board, as Christy mentioned, increasing transparency into past records of officers so that officers that have abused their power in one department are not shuffled over to another department. Um, working with police unions to ease the process of accountability. Um, these things are critical because accountability equals trust, equals community support for the vast majority of our law enforcement officers. Everybody needs to feel supported at work. That includes law enforcement and communities also need to feel safe. So when you have communities that do not feel safe because of the police, that is something that we need to address. All of this said, these are not easy conversations. We cannot solve this with bumper sticker politics. So what I can commit to as city council person is to bring people to the table who normally would not be at a table together, to have the meaningful and sometimes difficult conversations between communities and zone four so that we can reach practical solutions to get the kind of policing that each of our different neighborhoods wants to see. Thank you. And a question to you, Reverend Murray. Well, I'm gonna go on the flip side because being in public service for a long time, the police say that their motto is to protect and serve, but lately, across the country, it's done got to the point to where the police feel like they have to go on the defense to protect themselves. 
that should not be happening. And I know in the real world, you can't keep it on a zero balance. But you know what? There are some ways that we can turn that tide. One is whenever the police are coming on the force, when they have training, I saw in another state, they was also teaching education in schools, especially on the middle school level. And they got them together and they started teaching like a partnership type of venue where the child didn't have to be a spade of the police, but where can the child serve in an area to help the police? See, we done got to the point now do where we don't get police that getting careers. They don't hardly stay long in certain instances because it's so hard. It's hard to maintain the correct position as a police officer with the lawlessness that's going on. And for good public service, safety, they have to feel comfortable. They have to feel like somebody is in the trenches with them. And I believe that if we start that early education like that state, give them some more confidence, some more training, some more we're with you, it'll get better. Thank you. Okay, for this next uh, round, we'll, we'll start with um, Christy and then we'll move in this direction. Um, uh, Christy, uh, how will you ensure affordable housing in growth areas like Hazelwood Green and Swiss Elm Park Slags? How would you reinvest in rehabilitating dilapidated structures? That is an issue that's close to my heart. Um, I have a passion for like, abandoned buildings um, and repurposing them. I live in one that was repurposed. And I feel like doing that as much as possible would definitely be a good thing for the community and it helped maintain the character of the community a little bit more than demolishing everything that we have and building something new. It seems like we were in a trend of doing that a lot for a while. Um, so it's nice to see a swing back the other way and repurposing the things that we have, um, saving resources and going about it that way. Um, can you repeat the rest of the question? I lost the rest of the question. I'm just, um, and how would you ensure, ensure affordable housing in, in these growth areas? Okay, so working with legislator, legislature to, um, like as far as zoning, zoning goes, um, making certain places, like certain zones, I totally lost my train of thought with that. That is a horrible, horrible answer, but I'm going to admit that and then I'm gonna start over again. <laughs> <laughs> so yes so still with zoning but making sure that all of the areas are zoned in a way that they need to be to have housing accessible to people who can't afford it um and i feel like we've done a pretty good job of doing that so i feel like just continuing to do that is what we need to do and focus on also the residents who have homes who need help with stuff also. I don't feel like all of the things need to, all of our resources need to be dedicated specifically to that. They need to be distributed equally, which is part of affordable housing, but you get them. Thank you. Well, You're next. Uh, we have the opportunity with Hazelwood Green and with, I call it uh, Somerset too. <laughs> okay. Um, Somerset to to uh, have well planned communities. Pittsburgh is the craziest city in the world in that we have numbered streets intersect one another and it like nowhere else in the world. You know, it's not not a grid because geography doesn't allow that. But we have the opportunity to make it a well planned community. Uh, I think it's important that it's mixed income housing that we somehow find a way and that we have some communities that are mixed housing income areas in Pittsburgh. Uh, we ensure that there's well-planned traffic patterns uh, so not to strain current residential areas. And I think we need to really work with the URA and RIDC to see how we can uh, put this thing together. And so I, I don't think we're ready there yet, but, and hopefully I haven't seen any shovels in the ground up in Swiss Home Park there, but, uh, 
that that's where I would see this going is just that us we have the opportunity to make it well planned out and to make sure ensure that it's mixed income. Thank so. you. Development to me is pretty sometimes it's it's pretty tricky because when you have people coming in and they have no informed way of understanding how the community is going to address their development coming in, then you run into the first problem of the development without displacement. Then you run into sometimes they're telling you they're going to have a certain amount of units of low income housing. But once they get started, once they get started, if the community is not holding them to it, they can get away with it. And it's done happen throughout the entire city. And I know if I was in church, I'd hear an amen. But as we continue on, one of the things we have to make sure is that we create a strategy to enhance the opportunities for affordable housing. Don't just buy out with what plan they want to hand us, but we should have a plan. We have a plan in Greater Hazelwood. I have it sitting here. It's designed to police them and keep them accountable. We are putting out, you will not build without community engagement design that we already have strategized and written down in documentation. I done found this out. When you got something in your hand, development, developers got a way of being a little more serious minded about the way the community wants to attune to them developing in the neighborhood. And so that's what we designed to do, but not just for Hazelwood, because it's happening more than Hazelwood. But since we have a plan, I want to bring it to all the other communities and let them take a look at it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there is no doubt that we have a housing crisis in Pittsburgh and also here in District 5. If you go on Craigslist right now and search within a mile of 15207, not only are family homes with three bedrooms going for upwards of twelve to $1,500 a month, you also can't find anything. There's simply nothing available. Um, Short term, I would say that what we can start with is fixing the housing authority, which is in charge of Section 8. Right now, if you are a landlord who wants to open your uh, home or apartment or house to Section 8, you cannot get through to the housing authority. So those are landlords that are just being lost. In the meantime, we have people who have their Section 8 vouchers and then are losing them and going back on years long waiting lists because there are no apartments for them to rent. So on the one hand, landlord outreach for the housing authority, and at the same time, landlord accountability for those landlords who are in the section eight programming, but who are neglecting their properties to the detriment of tenants and to neighborhoods. Um, another short term issue, which I believe I mentioned before is, outreach and oversight at the URA. Uh, the URA has seen $75 million in American Rescue Plan money, and there is $10 million a year in the Housing Opportunity Fund. We need to make sure that that money is going to the people who need it most. Long term, because I'm out of time, inclusionary zoning, continuing to work with Hazelwood Initiative, City of Bridges, and other organizations to build more affordable housing, and fixing the land banks so that people who want to improve homes can get the liens lifted quickly, get those homes, turn them into community gardens, affordable housing, small businesses, whatever that may be to improve the neighborhoods that they're in. Thank you. All right, our next question, since we're bouncing back, um, is gonna go to Mac first. For me. Yeah, going to Mac first, and then we're still gonna continue the answers this way. Yeah. Sorry, just keeping you on your toes tonight. <laughs> All right, Pittsburgh does not compare well to other cities on the amount of, on the amount and the kinds of plastic, glass, and organic waste that it recycles. If Pittsburgh receives funding from the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, would you use those funds to increase the amount of recycling in Pittsburgh? I think the problem with recycling right now is finding a market for recycled goods. I don't quite understand it. Uh, aluminum, we okay? You're pointing at me. Okay, what's that? 
Oh, um, that's okay. Uh, but I, I think that we need to increase our involvement in recycling. And I would be in favor of uh, using other funding from the federal government for recycling. I don't understand how we can't get rid of glass. Glass seems to be the most basic thing in the world. It's made out of sand. And I'm not a scientist, but can't we make it back into sand just by smashing it up? Uh, plastics, I mean, it seems like that there used to be a great market for that. And now that market has sort of dried up. And so we got to find someone else to buy the plastics. The aluminum is not hard to get rid of. And I don't really think paper products are that hard to get rid of. But I, I am in favor of recycling. I think it's a great thing. It relieves the pressure on uh, landfills which would save the city money dumping at landfills. The other thing is finding a location to do this stuff at. And so we need to find a place to do that. Thank you. And the question goes to Reverend Murray next. Thank you. Well, one thing about it, I'm not a technology guru, but technology is playing a huge part in transforming a lot of things that we are able to do now that we were not able to do, even as it relates to the recycling. And then through technology, we come to find out that there are more available items that can actually be produced through it. Our thing is sometimes we start off doing it properly as far as segregating which prop items we want to put where, and now we don't got to where you can basically put it all in the blue can and as long as it's cardboard or plastic or whatever item we say you can, you just throw it all in there, then they throw it in the back of the truck. I've seen the recycling plant, and I'm wondering how in the world is this guy, other than pulling out wood or something, is knowing what exactly to pull out of the bunch that's going to be used in a usage way somewhat faster than going through a long, long, drawn-out process. I think more policing how we are collecting them what we intend to do with them, how much money we can save by them, and then even hire more people to do it. I know that the city says that to a limit, we're almost at our hiring limit, but you know what? If there's an investment that's gonna get a return, then I see sometimes it's worth it. Put these young, give these young people an opportunity. How hard will it be to separate one item from another when you got a job when you was too, trying to find one and you couldn't, and I'm quite sure the pay will be above minimum wage. Thank you. And the question to you, Barb. Um, yeah, so as far as using Federal Inflation Reduction Act money to increase recycling services, that's something I would have to really look at more closely, I'm not sure. Um, uh, that said, um, I, well, of course, I support recycling and we fill up our blue bins as a family of six uh, much faster than I would like to admit. Um, I would really like to see more of a reduction in waste. Um, I definitely commend Councilwoman Strasburger on her plastic bag ban. That's a great step forward that's sort of coming down the pipe shortly. Um, I think we could also uh, improve pickup of green waste so that it's not so infrequent and uh, as well as making it a lot easier to recycle um, electronic waste. Now you have to make an appointment and drive it down and it's just an enormous hassle to get rid of a computer or a TV the right way. And it makes it a lot easier to get rid of it the wrong way, which is dumping it over a ravine or something like that. So I think I'll, I'll leave my answer at that. Thank you. And lastly, there, Christy. So recycling is, that's a large, large issue, larger than can fully be addressed by the city. But if we were to receive money, I would definitely advocate for using it for recycling. Um, I was very disheartened to learn that a lot of the things that we were putting into our recycling bins weren't actually being recycled. Um, so a little bit wasteful that like the act of us doing it is a waste um and it not going to the appropriate places is an even bigger waste um but with the funding i feel like we could offer grants to some suppliers who could retool the existing equipment that they have um 
and reconfigure existing plans to just help with that a little bit more. The issue is a contracting issue. There aren't really that many places that do it. Um, so identifying more places that accept recycling stuff would for sure be a way to go. Um, and as I, I can't remember for sure which one of you guys mentioned it, but place it like dropping off TVs, that is a huge, huge issue. That is a huge pain. Um, we had to drop off one maybe two weeks ago. My son dropped one off, but it took him probably two days to figure out the right place to do it. And then you had to schedule a time. The time is only from like six, two to six or four to six. It's a very small window compared to what it probably should be. But long story short, it's much more difficult than it needs to be to get rid of something like that. And I know that we aren't the only family who has that problem. Um, we see TVs on the streets all the time that the collectors don't take um, because that's not the right place for them to go. So more information about what to do with them and more options. Thank you. Okay, well, now we're going to start a lightning round, <laughs> okay. which is um, basically we're going to be asking questions that have a yes, no answer to them. And you're starting with me. And I'm going to be starting with um, with Barb on this and and we'll be going um, that way. So, okay. so just to clarify, it's yes or no. Well, yes. Or, yeah. I mean, yeah. Less than 30 seconds, you know. Okay. 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 Very okay. quick. Very quick. So, um, so the first question is, would you make the recruitment of women and people of color a high priority for the Bureau of Police? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I would say yes. I think it's an important thing to do. Yes, Chris. definitely working with them. That's the makeup is very much white male. Um, I feel like there are a lot of things that we could do to, to increase recruitment. Okay, thank you. Next question is going to start with Reverend Murray and move that way and then end with Barb. Do you support the women's bodily autonomy, autonomy including reproductive rights? Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure how this would fit into uh, city council, but yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, the recent decision was devastating. Um, absolutely support, support that. Uh, yes, and for November 8th, it is critical that we elect Josh Shapiro, John Fetterman, and Summer Lee, and I am committed to knocking as many doors as I possibly can, making as many phone calls, both for myself and for them, uh, as well as my team of mighty volunteers. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with um, Mac on this one. We're going to go. I'm ready to go. Yeah, we're ready to go. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Would you support a change to the Home Rule Charter to, to permit the city to regulate firearms? I recognize the Second Amendment. Oh, uh, yes, I would. I would say yes. Okay. I, I thought some people were elaborating. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Barb? Oh, yes. How about yes? Okay. <laughs> All right. Our next question will start with Christy and then go Barb, Reverend Murray, and Mac. Um, are the current transportation options public transportation, uh, the jun Junction Hollow bike trail, the university sh sh shuttles sufficient for connecting Hazelwood Green and Oakland? No. To you, Bob? I'm very sad this is a yes or no question, but uh -huh. my answer is no. <laughs> well, my, my statement is I'll have to take a look into it. I would have to look into it further because I can't elaborate. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now, now we're good. We have um, we have plenty of time. I think. Sure. Okay, so um, Mac, you're starting on this one, and we are um, going this direction now. Okay, 
And okay. um, do you support requiring that, do you support requiring that all new construction in Pittsburgh meet green building standards? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. And go, uh, Reverend Murray, you're going to start this one. Should the city be arresting and charging people for marijuana possession instead of issuing citations? I don't know the legal amount, so I'm going to refrain. I don't know the legal amount. Okay. And to you, Barb? No. Christy? A hard no. <laughs> I, I would say no. I mean, okay. Um, so then who are we going? Uh, Barb, you start this one. Um, do you support more formal collaboration between the Pittsburgh public schools and the city of Pittsburgh? Yes, absolutely. For sure. As an educator, yes. Yes. And Chrissy, you'll start this one and we'll come my way. Should the city fund after school programs for public school children? Absolutely. Yes. 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 There you go. That went very quickly. <laughs> okay. So. And that's the end of our questions. That's the end of our questions. So um, you guys really kept within the limits. So we can start the um, closing statements now. Um, the uh, candidates we each have. See you. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no question. No questions from the floor. Sorry. Okay. Um, the there are um, each candidate has one minute, and the order of of closing statements will be um, Christy, Mac, Reverend Murray, and um, and Barb. One minute? Yes. Okay. All right. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. I know that this is not where you want to be right now necessarily, but it's a very important job and I'm glad that you're here. Um, second, I, as you know, from how I answered one or two of the questions, I don't claim to be an expert on anything, but what I am an expert in is investigating. And if I don't know the answer to something, I know how to find the answer to something. And that is something that I plan to do in the city council position. I, public safety is my wheelhouse. Affordable housing and that kind of thing aren't necessarily my areas of expertise. So investigating more and figuring out along those, like what we should do to encourage that um, is for sure something that I'm going to go home and do tonight. Um, and yeah, with that, just thank you. I appreciate you guys being here. And also thank you guys. Um, I know there are four candidates and it's not necessarily a great thing to have four candidates vying for the same position, but oops. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for coming out, out tonight. I appreciate it. I think it's a great opportunity for you to meet the candidates. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to meet you. The reason I got into this race is because I was most concerned with vacant and delinquent tax properties. Tax delinquent properties and vacancy, vacant properties are a problem in Pittsburgh. I'd like to get those back on the tax roll and I'd like to find alternative streams of taxation in Pittsburgh to get away from the 3% wage tax, which I think is hurting us uh, and attracting and retaining people. Am I up? Oh, okay. Would we get a minute? Oh, okay. It seemed like more than a minute. The, uh, I, I think, and I know this has been brought up before, I think the idea of a commuter tax is something, and I know that would have to happen on a state level, but a commuter tax I think would be fair. I also think that our uh, tax, okay. <laughs> I, I wasted like a few of my seconds after <laughs> I love the city of Pittsburgh. I've been here 68 years. I worked in the public with the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority 39 years, 35 years outside of the building and in the public. 
I've served this ward 16 years plus as a committee person on my third elective term for secretary. I've really worked in the cold, in the warm. I've served these communi my community and our surrounding communities. I don't think I need to pledge too much. I've worked hard and I believe this as I use this for my model with the team I coached. Hard work should pay off. I'm gonna leave that with the committee. Thank you so much for having given me a chance to come and share my ideas. God bless you all. Okay, so I got my start in community organizing through my neighborhood's fight to stop the Mon Oakland connector. For six years, we worked together, grew our coalition and made the case for our solutions. We worked for what was right until we won. But that fight was about more than just a shuttle road through a public park. It was about big money special interests being prioritized while the needs of residents were going unmet. That's why I'm running for city council, to meet those needs. Over the years, I've worked hard to protect our parks, expand bus service, support food access, make sure kid, our kids have pools, playgrounds, and after-school programs, and advocated for safe streets, especially along the routes they walk to school. The bottom line is that we need a proactive, engaged, and informed city council representative, someone who is on the ground in every community, who listens, responds, and follows up with meaningful solutions. I'm ready to be that representative. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate the time and preparation that the candidates have done. And, and as I began with, you've had an opportunity to meet the candidates, to see the candidates, and most importantly, you've had an opportunity to hear them talk okay. about the issues. Yeah. So I look forward now to everyone coming to vote next week at the Firefighters Hall on the 15th. And I hope that this forum has helped inform you. I also want to thank our moderators. And give it And a big hand to all of us for being here and doing the hard work of being committee members. Thank you. Good night.